Uh, good evening, everybody. I, I can't tell you how honored and privileged I am to be here in the Caribbean. Um, I can't say that talking about Brexit is, is ever a, something you feel honored and privileged to be talking about, but I do feel very honored and privileged to be here and to be able to be part of the many discussions that we are having at our conference and uh, that, that are being held here. Um, so thank you very much and thank you very much to everybody for, for coming uh, and for talking about what is really a very vexed subject, as you would imagine. Um, so I think probably I have to preface the whole talk by the question of who knows because uh, at the moment nobody really knows um, what is going to happen. We all feel like we're walking over the edge of a cliff. But I thought this metaphor of broken bridges was a very good metaphor because there were many bridges built up around the European Union. Many bridges about solidarity, about a whole lot of different countries being able to work together across many differences. And in fact, the European Union has been one of them, the most successful peace projects after the Second World War, maintaining um, a peace between the, the many member states, uh, creating, cre creating bonds between people of very different cultures. Uh, and what happened with the Brexit referendum is that these bridges are being broken and people are rushing off in all kinds of different directions without really taking notice of each other. The, the, the avenues of communication have been splintered and fragmented and we hardly get people talking to each other anymore. Uh, people are talking around each other, against each other, beyond each other. And you can see from the way I presented that to me this this whole saga is a tragic one uh, and a sad one. So, um, and particularly, uh, my particular interest is in equality. Both the Court of Justice of the European Union and the European Union as a whole recognise equality as a fundamental principle of EU law. And this was very crucial because this took the whole idea of social rights out of the sphere of having to be defended as a level playing field and into the sphere of being able to be defended in their own right as having intrinsic worth as social rights. And finally, probably the culmination, maybe not finally because it's still moving, um, from the idea of simply a common market we have the EU having its own Charter of Fundamental Rights, uh, not to be confused with the European Convention on Human Rights, which it which often is. The European Convention on Human Rights was much more of a post-war document on civil and political rights. The EU Charter of Fundamental Rights is a very modern document which combines social uh, and civil and political rights, which includes some very much more um, up to date, as we, as we might say, reflections of where social rights have gone. And although this isn't a perfect scenario, it's an evolving scenario. And because of social dialogue, it's always been a scenario in which um, civil society, trade unions, and others could at least make an effort to have an influence uh, and have had some influence over time. Now, um, I said I was going to talk about re-emerging challenges. It's not as though this is all plain sailing or it's, it's all easy going. And the re-emerging challenges came from the accession to the European Union from Eastern Europe of um, countries with a low wage model. And you can imagine, if you think of the European Union as a microcosm of the world, where we might get social dumping or movement of capital to areas with the lowest wages, then many of the Eastern European countries had made the decision, although they were coming out of state socialism, which did have quite a developed social model, the idea was to develop their economies largely through low wages, 
And that meant that when they moved their capital freely to other countries with high wages, uh, there was a threat to the countries with higher wages of exactly the same thing happening internally as was uh, likely might have happened at the beginning of the European Union. Um, and um, it's, it, for those of you who are more familiar with the complexities of the European Union as a legal entity, which are very complex, um, this is called posting of workers. So many companies would post or relocate workers on a temporary basis from Eastern European countries to countries with developed collective bargaining, developed quite high minimum wage and social rights, and want to pay their workers at that lower rate. And this became a great threat to workers in the higher wage economies of undercutting collectively bargained rates. So there was legislation within the European Union, which I won't go into the legal complexities of it, as I say, it's quite a complex piece of legislation called post Workers Directive, which on the face of it did underpin, it said minimum conditions in the host country must apply to these temporary post workers. But the problem was that the European Court of Justice, um, which often has taken a robust view of social rights, in, the, in this case, a whole series of cases uh, took a, a very narrow view of what these minimum conditions were and in fact very strongly favoured free movement of capital over protection of social rights. I mention this, and you might wonder why this all matters for Brexit. I mention this because this is one of the reasons why some people on the left and some trade unions in the UK, in the UK United Kingdom have supported leaving the European Union and they always cite the Court of Justice's very narrow interpretation of um, trade union rights in, um, again for those of you familiar, series of cases starting with Viking, Lavelle, Rufford cases in which they regard the Court of Justice of the European Union as having uh, really under, un, um, undermined workers' rights. However, so there were two areas it was that minimum wages could be paid below collectively bargained uh, rates and even worse, uh, strikes by the local unions to maintain those were held by the Court of Justice to be that they had to be proportional to the interest in free movement of capital. So I, I, I mention this now because the European Union has faced these internal challenges um, with the result that a whole lot of posted workers moved from Eastern European countries to countries with higher conditions, including a great movement of workers, particularly from Poland to the UK. And um, this has caused this caused a lot of dissension on the part of workers within the higher wage economies uh, as well as um, elsewhere. However, I think these challenges have, have recently been addressed within the European Union structures, partly because the Eastern European low-wage economies have realised that it's not really a good model of development, and their trajectory towards development could not really continue to, to, to develop along low wages. And they found that many of their workers were emigrating, they were losing important people, they had a low birth rate and they were trying to attract their workers back. So that together with the new directive um, shows that the European Union has had these challenges and has faced it. But this is the, the name for the people on the left in the United Kingdom, not the Brexiteers, but the Lexiteers, that is the left for exiting the uh, the European Union um, still blame the European Court of Justice for its narrow interpretation and the Labour Party in the UK, splintered as it is, has among some of the most vocal, some of the strongest influences within the leadership of the Labour Party right now regard the European Union as um, 
a force for globalization which should be resisted and as anti-workers' rights. However, um, as I'll show over the years, and so now I'm coming back to the UK, which you might wonder what happened to the UK and Brexit, but this is really important for setting the scene. Um, against the Lexiteers, as I think I'll show, actually the strongly entrenched social rights within the European Union have been the bulwark against much of the, many of the attempts within the United Kingdom to undermine workers' rights. And I think outside of the European Union, those threats will be emerging in a very powerful way. So let's roll back a bit and think about, very quickly go through how workers' rights have been um, approached within the United Kingdom. So there is this trajectory which I call from abstentionism to regulation via deregulation. So what, what is meant by that? The um, famous maxim of Otto von Freud, who was um, a labor lawyer who came from the Weimar Republic, fled Germany just before the war, came to the United Kingdom, scarred with the, the um, experience of the collapse of the Weimar Republic and the rise of Nazism. Uh, what he said was, what the state has not given, the state cannot take away. And what he meant by that is, we should not rely on the state to give workers' rights. We should rely on collective bargaining. We should rely only on collective strength. And he discerned within the UK a kind of model of labour law, where there were very, very few statutory rights for workers, and almost all those rights came from collective bargaining and industrial relations. This was the way before the European Union came onto the scene. Um, uh, however, as we know, collective bargaining has never really been good for some kind of workers, particularly women workers and precarious workers, uh, non-standard workers. So even in the UK, there was a move in the 1970s to have legislated rights um, under what was also called within the UK the social contract. Um, but the real test for this idea that primarily workers' rights came from collective bargaining came during the, the time of Thatcherism, where Thatcherism, with a very neoliberal approach, uh, immediately put pay to the idea that what the state has not given, the state cannot take away, because of course, the only reason collective bargaining was, permitted, was flourishing previously was because the state implicitly committed it. And as soon as Thatcherism came in, collective bargaining was, um, and, and strikes, and all of the collective labour rights were decimated, and there we found that European Union law was the main bulwark for workers' rights. So that's why this, this saga of how the European Union moved towards, from a trading bloc towards entrenched workers' rights has been very important for the UK because, uh, again, as you know, there is no constitution, written constitution in the UK. Everything is subject to parliamentary sovereignty. There is no back, um, I nearly said backstop, but that would be a bad idea. Um, there is no underpinning from uh, a constitutional right against Parliament unpicking, changing laws, um, and the only um, prevention for that was the fact that the UK was bound by EU law, and with it bound by the rights that were coming through the EU law. Um, and this is particularly true if we think about equality, for example, Equality is a paradigm example. In most countries, you would have a right to equality in the written constitution. There was and there is no such written constitution in the European, in the United Kingdom. But especially in the time of Thatcherism and subsequently, when there was a real desire to roll back most of the labour rights, those rights which were entrenched in uh, EU law were protected, and this is particularly true 
of equality rights, which continue to develop throughout this period. Um, as I said, equality has become recognized as a fundamental right under European Union law. And because of the particular uh, way in which the EU binds all its member states, parliamentary sovereignty was in practice limited by the EU law and um, unusually in the situation of parliamentary sovereignty, EU law can be used by the courts in the UK, in the UK to disapply UK legislation if it goes against uh, the right to equality and other rights. Uh, also, again, this is a, a technical term which I can expand on, but direct effect means that you could go to court in the UK, even if there was no UK legislation, and get the court to enforce EU, right, EU legislation, both against the state, that's vertical, and against uh, private employers, that's horizontal. So you can see that there was a very powerful effect of the EU law um, on the UK. Courts were also bound by the EU law and by the decisions of the Court of Justice of the EU. This is also something which irritates the Brexiteers a lot. Uh, they want to take back control. The uh, Court of Justice is one of the main objects of, uh, I could call it vilification, in, amongst the Brexiteers in the UK. They don't really like the fact that particularly this uh, attempt towards neoliberalism could be restrained by the Court of Justice. So this is the objection from the right. The objection from the right is against the Court of Justice is exactly the converse of the objection from the left of the Court of Justice. The objection from the right is that the Court of Justice is protecting workers' rights, um, is interfering with parliamentary sovereignty. The objection from some on the left, but not all, but just this one body of, of things on the left is that the Court of Justice is not sufficiently in favour. And so we get an unholy alliance of uh, the leadership of the Labour Party and the leadership of the Conservative Party actually both supporting Brexit uh, for entirely opposite reasons um, and yet um, particularly uh, from my perspective kind of on the left of politics in the UK, uh, the, lay, the leadership of the Labour Party doesn't realise that what it's doing is actually feeding in to um, the, the, the um, potential for trade to undermine workers' rights. So I'll say that something more about that shortly. But what I did want to say was uh, also to situate this discussion which is going on in the UK about the needing to take back control. Because what I would like to emphasize is that actually, particularly around equality rights, this has been a very mutual relationship between the UK and the EU. And also among civil society trade unions, the idea about the European Union being a common, uh, a common space, a place for solidarity between women's groups of all different countries, solidarity between trade unions, has meant that we can all work together across boundaries to improve specifically equality rights. So I like this picture of these two trees growing together, which now need to be severed, and you can imagine the pain that some of us might feel about taking it all apart. So just very quickly um, to say that this little, little um, illustration of the cross-fertilization in relation to equality law, that um, the concept of indirect discrimination, for example, which we know originated to some extent in the US, found its way across the Atlantic to the UK and then to the, the EU. Race discrimination legislation uh, actually was lacking in the European Union. The UK was much ahead on race discrimination, uh, but it then um, became part of European Union law only in 2000. And the same with disability discrimination, or that was much, uh, the UK was much ahead. 
On the other hand, the UK has benefited from very robust uh, rights around pregnancy, around parenting rights, uh, sexual orientation, age, religion and belief all came in to the UK from the European Union and are now in legislation in the UK, the Equality Act 2010. Um, and this has also been because of many inputs from the, U from the UK to the EU and the other way. So the way in which the uh, jurisprudence develops before the Court of Justice of the European Union is by referrals from domestic courts. So many of the seminal cases in front of the Court of Justice have been argued by lawyers from the UK, as argued in favour and argued against. Um, and because, again, the, as I said, there was this space called social dialogue, which was an, uh, an official space for trade unions from all over Europe, including the TUC and uh, the CBI, which is the uh, British Business Body Confederation, were able to have tripartite discussions through social dialogue, and that actually led to the parenting rights and rights for part-time workers, which I'll come to now. As well as this, on the book, the, the, um, the level of uh, labour law more generally, there have been a lot of inputs from the EU into the UK recently, um, many more inputs from the EU than outputs from the UK. So for example, maximum working time, paid holidays, uh, workplace restructuring, transfer of undertakings, which basically protects workers' rights on mergers, transfers and self-contracting out, insolvency guarantees, quite a lot of legislation on information consultation. Particularly important have been um, provisions on atypical work that is part-time temporary agency workers. Um, and there is now further work which is happening in the European Union, which the UK unfortunately will miss out on, on uh, work-life balance. So, um, what then is going to happen with Brexit? Well, um, I think we can sum it up by saying certain rights will be unentrenched. They, they became entrenched through the European Union. They will become unentrenched. And they, they function on different levels. So we don't have a constitution. Um, some of the rights that came from the EU have been put into statute. And if they're in statute, in principle, they can be repealed through Parliament. So any statute, parliamentary sovereignty is going to reassert itself in full after leaving the European Union, which means that many of these rights that I've talked about can be repealed. Um, so the statutory rights can be repealed through ordinary parliamentary process, and that will include equality rights. Without a constitutional vacuum, there is no protection for equality rights except through the political process. But it's, it's worse than that because um, some of the European Union legislation can, could be incorporated into the UK through uh, secondary legislation, that is delegated legislation, which can be repealed by the executive without the body. And that's true of all of the uh, legislation on precarious work, part-time fixed term and agency, and ministers in, in the government however long this government is going to last, but they've already said the first thing they're going to do is get rid of rights for precarious workers. And they can do it just through delegated legislation. Um, um, even more worrying is that in the withdrawal bill, which has been sitting around for some time now, they've placed something called Henry VIII clauses. Now Henry VIII was the last king in the UK who could change legislation because he was the king. It was before Parliament took over the legislative power on the executive. So the use of Henry VIII is itself worrying. But basically, <laughs> what it means, and not to mention what Henry VIII did to all his wives. <laughs> um, so they have called Henry VIII clauses quite openly and happily. Um, but because the executive feels that there is so much that 
that they will need to do to change all of the EU law that's come in over the, over all the decades, that, some, that they've given themselves power to sometimes repeal even primary legislation which otherwise would have had to go through Parliament. Um, going forward, the courts will no longer need to follow the Court of Justice of the European Union, which means that any further development in the jurisprudence around equality or labour rights will no longer apply in the UK, um, and there is no longer any place at the table for social dialogue. So outside of the EU then, um, what is what is life going to look like? Well, we don't know, but the worst scenario, the worst case scenario of the no deal, the Brexiteers very happily talk about, oh well, we'll operate under WTO rules. Well, WTO rules are a very, very risky so far as workers' rights are concerned. Um, and the, um, the real difficulty is that free trade takes total uh, prior place, is given, it is able to trump workers' rights in most cases under WTO rules. Um, in the UK, a lot of the Brexiteers talk about entering into a brave new world where the UK can enter into all of its own trade deals. They see that as a great bonus of leaving the European Union, that they can now enter into many greatly advantageous trade deals with many countries. Um, a little bit of a, I think, uh, hankering after a colonial past which no longer thankfully exists but in the minds of them they feel that they can enter into these great trade deals but the worry is that how do we enter how what does it mean to say that a trade deal is advantageous well often it might mean the very thing that i started off with at the beginning which is trade is used to undercut workers rights which um Within a trade deal, there is no protection for workers' rights or for uh, other aspects related to workers. Um, within the UK, the UK, there is going to be very little uh, accountability for these trade deals because um, all of the trade deals until now have been negotiated through the EU. The EU has, I've got 65, but it's now I think about 70 or 72 different trade deals between the EU and many other countries. Because the EU is quite a strong negotiating bloc, it can dictate certain terms and conditions to its trade partners. And largely speaking, it has incorporated some protections for workers' rights within these trade deals. Uh, the most recent one is the trade deal with Canada. Um, those of you who are familiar with, with that process will be familiar with that. There was some contestation of the protecting of trade unions, of, of workers' rights through that. But once it's the UK on its own, the bargaining power of the UK is going to be very little. Uh, and the worry is that what will the UK do to get these advantageous trade, uh, trade deals will be to bargain away workers' rights. Um, and that is why the leadership on the left who think that this alliance with the right of leading the EU is a good thing, is very worrying, I think, for, for the very thing that they think they stand for. The other worrying thing is that under, because trade deals are entered into as international agreements, uh, they don't have to go through Parliament in the same way. So how these trade-offs of workers' rights are going to happen is not going to have to go through Parliament, and how we all input into those trade-offs is not going to be obvious. So the real worry is that the UK might agree to roll back minimum rights in order to be more competitive uh, because of having been in a weak position from other countries. Uh, who are likely to require greater access for their companies 
that intended to deliver public services in the UK as a price of a fair trade deal. Um, so uh, already we hear countries saying that this is a great opportunity for them to come into the UK and um, participate in this great wave of privatisation of public services, which um, has already started. And that's because of the way in which current trade agreements liberalise not just trading goods but also services and investment. That's the GATT 1996. And this includes services such as water, healthcare, accountants, and transport, and potentially more. So it requires that public services must be open to competition. Um, it is possible, as those of you who are trade lawyers here, I, I'm not a trade lawyer, so I would welcome people's contributions on this. But as you will be aware, government can exclude some kind of public services in their trade deals as the EU did in the Canadian trade agreement, which is CETA, but um, when it's just the UK without the whole of the EU, we don't know how to do this. So the risks are already there in the global trade situation, and it already happened that governments can be sued by private companies and investment tribunals under the most favoured nation rule because under that rule, foreign products and now foreign services need to be treated as least as well as local ones. And um, these investment state tribunals can be even more binding than human rights commitments and operate in a very non-transparent way. So what we are finding, what we could find is that this um, aversion to the Court of Justice of the European Union, which is a public court following public rules, could instead be replaced by investment tribunals, which are really born out of bilateral arbitration uh, arrangements and don't necessarily have the kind of public accountability. Um, other risks are that if there's a reduction in trade tariffs, there would be a reduction in, in revenues to government, and um, rolling back of public services will not only reduce workers' rights, but will also reduce public services, <coughs> with the result that at least for women workers and, and any other workers who have to engage in unpaid work, there will be a, an increased burden of that. So, uh, those are the, the dire possibilities which seem to be more and more likely as the days go by and no deal is reached. Um, what could we do to protect labour rights? Well, there's a lot of discussion about this, but so far everybody's so busy shouting at each other, beyond each other, that nothing has been really settled. One thing could be to do what the European Union does, which is to try to export some of its social model through, through the trade agreements. Um, whether the UK even has the desire to do this, we don't know. We could um, try to maintain existing standards. Um, how do we get even better standards and how do we enforce it? So the maintaining of existing standards could come through non-regression clauses and we can talk if everyone's interested in how we incorporate non-regression clauses into trade agreements so that at least existing standards are not there, are not undermined. If the UK enters into, continues to relate to the European Union, a much better scenario would be having a common rule book where new rights come in with new EU law. But this is exactly why the Brexiteers are so angry about the backstop. If you want to talk about the backstop, we can in due course. But um, it seems very unlikely that the UK is going to agree to having a common rule with the European Union. And the bottom line is even if social rights are placed in trade agreements, we still have the problem of enforcement. And as I said, Will it go through these investment tribunals? Will there be some other kind of court? And that's where, again, the aversion, which is becoming um, you know, just 
extremely emotional rather than rational to the European Court of Justice means that it's unlikely to be a place in which we could make use uh, of um, existing institutions to make sure that social rights are actually enforced even if they are through the trade deal. So we are entering into uncharted territory. As it says here, there's no path that are made, there is no path, paths are made by walking. As far as we can see so far, over that hill is a chasm. No one knows where it's going to go, where this path is going to go, what path is going to be charted. Um, but we, we, we hope, we still have living hope that um, reason might prevail. So thank you very much.